<laughs> so here we are today on a nice rainy Thursday afternoon in Austin, Texas, and I'm with two of the women that I admire most, Mia Magic Van <laughs> Whitney Miller, my fiance, and we wanted to have a chat with you guys. We got a nice cigar, we got a little rum to dip it in, we got some wine, so let everybody know that we're really relaxed and we really want to give you guys our best perspective on really what's going on and the topic that I wanted to cover the most which I thought you guys could help elucidate is what is it that girls and women yeah. have forgotten about themselves? Cause we've all forgotten. I've forgotten about myself a million times, but from your perspective, like what is it that the females of our society, our world in general, I forgot. Well, from my perspective, especially with the original definition of remember, which is etymologically, it is literally to put back the pieces of yourself, members, the, the pieces of our bodies. To remember is to put our pieces back together. And from my perspective, the, the pieces that we've lost are really our connection to the earth. And that leads to a disconnection from each other. We're not like loving and empowering each other and seeing each other as sisters. How does that, so break that down though, without making any assumptions, how does the disconnection from the earth, first of all, why are we disconnected from the earth? Second of all, how does that lead to the breakdown of seeing each other as female friends and whatever? You know, let's make sure we, we yeah. take a look at all these different steps because I think they're all really important. Yeah, I think the disconnection from the earth is part living in cities, not living in tribes, not mm -hmm. living close to the land. We're disconnected from the way we get our food. We used to grow our own food. We used to, the men would go out and hunt and skin and kill the animals and the women would skin them and tan the hides and make the clothes. And so there was this deep relationship to how we got all of the things that we have. It was like a part of our survival. Yeah. And I think until, unless you really recognize how impactful it is to actually have and cultivate your own food. Like when, when you went out and you hunted that deer mm. and we got to eat it for a while, like how different was that cooking the stew and cooking the meals with the food that we had taken, you know, lovingly from the field ourselves? Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's a, an experience that any meat eater should yeah. experience. And I grew up hunting and I didn't grow up hunting that way. I grew up hunting with a guide and I shot it and the guide would handle it for me. And then when we started hunting together, it was a completely different experience and it did change how important it was. And I also think what's different is yes, going in and cultivate, getting your own food and, and hunting your own food, but also making it like a celebration. You know, we mm. were celebrating the animal mm. and we did a prayer over the animal and, and it had so much gratitude. And then when I went to South Dakota, um, at the Indian reservation there, the mm -hmm. Lakota Indian reservation, we went out and killed a buffalo and skinned it right there. Wow. We drank the blood. We wow. ate the heart and ate the liver. And it was this beautiful celebration where the entire community came together for that. And I think that's really something that nobody does anymore. Yeah. yeah. You buy your meat in a styrofoam container with plastic wrapped around it and there's no connection to how it got into the grocery store. And, our, and it's not even just meat. I mean, meat is one of the strongest examples of that. Yeah. But like, I get stoked when we cook any part of our garden. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> like if I'm sauteing the Swiss chard from our garden, you know, I'm like the guy that's like, and that Swiss chard is from our garden. <laughs> and I'm all giddy and excited because it feels good. It yeah. feels good that I saw that when it was just dirt. And then I saw it come up and spring up from life, you know, watered by the rain and the sunshine of our home and, and our care. Yeah. You know, like, I actually go out there when I cut the chard. I'm like, ooh, thank you, chard. Great job. You look <laughs> yeah. great. Mm, crushed it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're going to taste good. Like, I don't know. It's funny. Yeah. That's yeah. my own little. <laughs> I had a little bite of it today when I went on and checked out your garden. I was like, right. oh, this looks nice. Yeah. And, and I think that that's really, that's just no, in, in Hawaiian, you know, they call it the aina. And the aina is the magical living land that feeds us. Mm. That's like what that word means. And, and they're always talking about the responsibility to the aina and, and their kuleana, how they worship and take care of 
the earth. And that's just something that for me growing up in, in the Redwoods, I've witnessed the beautiful people that take care of the trees and, and fight for them. And I see 6,000 year old beings just cut and dead and, you know, made into houses and all of these things. And, and people who aren't taking the time to say, Hey, does this 6,000 year old living being have something to say to me or teach me or, or tell me. And that's a big, you know, like Pocahontas, the Disney movie where she has grandmother Willow that I had grandmother Redwood and I always mm-hmm. talk to the trees. And when I say that people are like, Oh, okay. You're super weird. And that's fine. Like I am super weird. Um, the original definition of weird is moving in the direction of one's fate or destiny. So yes, I'm very weird. Um, <laughs> but that's a big part of it. If we, if we treat sentient beings like they don't matter and they're just commodities, then that does extend towards the way that we treat each other. And, and my experience with women until the last few years was like, what can, what can you do for me or what can I do for them? How does your status get me somewhere? How do, what do you have that I want? Or yeah, I mean, endless, just comparison and competition and just, really disempowered like how can we tear each other down instead of how can we build each other up i think another key thing to point out is the world needs bridges and i think one of the challenges is there's been the people who are of accord with what you just mentioned they love the trees so much but they don't really love people that much Mm. and they judge people and they look at another person instead of looking at the logger like a person who's maybe a dad who has kids, who's in a place where there aren't many jobs and they got a tough thing to do and they've made a decision to cut down the trees, which are being used in homes and being used. And they don't look at that person like, oh, I love you too. <laughs> like you're divine too. And are you the calling trees me are out, divine. Aubrey? No, I'm not. But I'm saying that, I'm saying that that's the, yeah. I think that's the key is that people have been put in baskets, right? Where, oh, you're the tree hugger. You're the yeah. hippie person. Yeah. Oh, you're the city person, right? You're this thing. Like you've identified with these. And I think what needs to happen is the merger of both of those where all things are valued. The logger is valued and the tree is valued. Yeah. And then you get to a place where both people can look at each other and be like, oh, and I see your perspective, yeah. you know, and I think that really helps. And I think that's something, you know, that I really admire about you, Wit, is that you're as yeah. comfortable in a metropolitan nightclub standing on top of a speaker twerking to Cardi B as you (laughs) are in the jungle drinking Mm. sacred plant medicine Mm. and being like, ah, I'm home, right? Like that's important to be able to find home all over the earth in man's creation as well as nature's creation. Yeah, and just, and I think it's important to give ourselves the opportunity to learn from and you don't have to go full blown. Like you don't have to go to ayahuasca in the jungle. You know, the first time I went, I did seven ayahuasca ceremonies. Don't recommend that for anybody ever. <laughs> but it, that's just kind of the personality that Wait, I am. Wait, you went too hard right out of the gate? Right, who would have thought? Who would have thought? <laughs> thought. Um, but I think it's just like realizing that everybody, no matter what background they come from, has something to teach you. And instead of seeing them as like competition or seeing them as different than you, it's like, okay, you've come into my life, like there, maybe there's something I can learn from you and it kind of shifts your perspective on something and then it, it, it's with everything across the board. Yeah, I get it. I mean, I get it all the time. Like in my spiritual communities, people know that I'm like, <laughs> what was that? <laughs> it was a bug. Was that one, of those, <laughs> one of those mosquito tax collectors trying to collect a little blood from me? I'm not in um, the jungle right now. Like. <laughs> <laughs> but people will ask like, they'll have a real strong bias against MMA. Oh, how could you be, you know, involved with such violence, Yeah, fighting. you know, and still promote such a peaceful, loving message. And, you know, explaining that, no, this is a sport and a contract between two people who've come to the agreement that they're going to bring their most ferocious self to challenge the other person to be their most ferocious, to see what they're capable of on the inside. And if you look at the end of these fights, 95% of the time, it's a big old hug of gratitude. Mm. Like, thanks for showing up with your best. You know, at the end of the toughest, toughest fights are the biggest 
biggest hugs. And usually typically. there's not like a lot of shit left over there. No. Like you, you left it all in the ring. And they're, mm. you know, a, a lot of the times in glory, they're bowing to each other because they come from Muay Thai backgrounds. So they're on their hands and knees, like bowing to each wow. other, giving so much gratitude for showing up and going through the hardship and leaving your family and not making much money and getting your ass beat for this like spectacle, this beautiful like game that they play with each other. Yeah. So they just play together. They play, yeah. Play together and challenge each other. Yeah. Like challenge each other to be the best. Like, you know how hard it is to go through camp knowing that you got to fight? You do? Yes, I do. How hard is that? It's how much shit hard. came up, you know? When we were, you were walking around, pacing around the grass, being like, what happens if I get knocked out? You know, like, and the weight cuts and all of the things associated. That's an immense challenge. It's a way to learn. And that could be a very sacred way to learn. Now, does it not come with a cost? Sure, it does. It comes with a cost. You take concussive brain trauma like there's it may not be the best way to learn but it is a way to learn and it's a sacred way to learn if you actually appreciate and see that so it's just removing this kind of bias around yeah. what is and what isn't and opening yourself up to the gamut of it so that if you are in the city you know recognizing how much power there might be in nature and if you are out in nature recognizing how much sacredness might be in the city and in sport and in totally. all these different things that's exactly what my, that's a perfect manifestation and like a continued powerful example and uh -huh. reminder. Thank you, Aubrey, as always. Um, you know, because I live between LA and Hawaii and I spend as much time as I can in Hawaii and just, but I, when I go there, I just shut everything off. And it's this really black and white way of being as opposed to having a really integrated, okay, I know how to access the parts of me that feel really alive and feel really at home in the jungle. And I bring those into my life in the city. And I bring that into the way that I exist in the concrete jungle, as opposed to the actual jungle. And yeah, it's, it's not super integrated. And if mm -hmm. I could be, and, and I have a hard time, like, Oh, well, my mission is in LA. So I'm, I'm on my mission. I'm doing the things that I need to be doing in order to be of service and to be, yeah, like feel on purpose. And yet it, it cre I create separation mm. in the way that I exist there because like, it's not nature. It doesn't make me feel the same instead of being like, okay, well, I know how nature makes me feel. How can I just call in that, that frequency, just that sense of calm and of deep nourishment that I get from the jungle and from the trees and from just being around things that are green and let that illuminate and also inform my way of being in the city. Yeah. So Whit, as someone who has, has the ability to experience the deep pleasure in both elements, you're also someone who works through resistance in some aspects toward the actual physical, you know, like going out and actually doing the nature stuff, right? Like it's almost easier to choose a different path. Mm. And, and I think that's probably common for most females. Like I think most females and most males too, probably know that, you know what, like a hiking trip would be good for me. It'd be good mm. for me to get out in nature, but there's like a bit of resistance there. There's like a, something that's kind of blocking the actual action steps necessary to recenter yourself in that way. So, you know, can you talk to like, what is that? Where does that come from? Like, where, what is the reason for that resistance? What is the reason why they don't want to go or they don't actually take enough steps to go reconnect with nature and be by themselves? I think it's, it's, it's uncomfortable. Like, I mean, obviously, you know, going into it's going to be uncomfortable, but it's, I'm so comfortable here. Yeah. <laughs> like maybe there's some way that I can really work through my own shit at home in AC with my friends <laughs> having wine because that sounds like more fun than being cold as fuck outside in the jungle or you know forest or something so I think it's but I think it's just realizing that if you're being called to do it at the end of it like there's it's going to be so beautiful there's going to be immense lessons that you would never be able to even come close to here at home so it's almost like that, that moment where you just, you have to recognize that the resistance, the resistance towards the challenging parts, because, you know, we've had friends who've talked about, wow, it, it was really hard for me to be by myself. Yeah. It's really hard for me to be still because that's when the stuff comes up. That's when your shit comes to the surface. We're like, what am I doing? Who am I with? What, 
Where am I seeking validation? What's going on? Like all of that stuff comes in the stillness that being in nature and being that with that provides. So it's easier to kind of push that away and keep yourself busy and active. And I think it's just like, you don't understand how much it really drives your life. Mm -hmm. How, how much that resistance and that distraction really drives it until you remove it, you know, until I go to Costa Rica on a surf trip by myself without a phone, which is what I did a few months ago. And it was like, very awesome, but very challenging yeah. for me. However, I came out on the other side, like just beaming, you wow. know, and me thinking like, okay, I need to go on another trip by myself soon is in my head, but it's, when am I going to have the time? Oh, but I want to spend time with, ah, oh, but I need to go here and I'm traveling this and I work this job. And it's just like, it keeps me kind of in that cycle of distraction. But I think it's when you feel that come up, when you're like, okay, I do need to do this it's the universe whispering at you until it's going to fucking scream. Yeah. So Mia, what, yeah. you know, you're deep into ritual and ways that people can connect, you know, like yeah. Wit's talking about a surf trip to Costa Rica. Well, that might not be viable even for a lot of people. Right. Yeah. I mean, that is maybe an optimal scenario, but let's say you got, you know, an a hour. couple hours, yeah. an hour, like yeah. how do you get that dose of nature, like that minimum viable dose of nature yeah. and connection with the great mother to kind of really nourish who you are as a woman? That is such a great question. And I think that, you know, that is the resistance is that she, the mother is where we have, we get everything from her. We get the wood in our houses. We get the food from her. We get the water from her. And because of religion, mostly we've been programmed into only like receiving the father God and not the mother. And so we just don't know that that's what nature is. And so we have this resistance because we've been told that she's not good or, or that she doesn't exist. And there's this sort of, yeah, just quiet that does show you everything else that you can, when you're surrounded by so many distractions that you can ignore. And so forest bathing is a real thing. And, um, you know, it means just going into a place where there are trees, where there are living things. Our, our eyes, actually our visual cortex is designed or has been programmed by our ancient nature to receive green differently than anything else. Cause it's life. It means there's water here. It means like you're going to be able to survive here because there are things that will nourish you. There are things that will allow you to, to thrive. And so for me, like the simplest thing is just being barefoot and going out into the earth and, and really just feeling, I like to make myself into a tree. Um, and you just feel as if your roots, as if your feet, as if the energy of your body is connecting to the earth and it can be golden strands of light, or it can literally be tree roots that you just envision coming out from underneath you and connecting you to the earth. The other thing is, is like bathing rituals. If there's a river, if there's a stream or a creek or a lake, even, you know, you guys have the Barton Springs pool. It's a natural pool. There's a bunch of other people there, but if you just let yourself float and you just allow yourself to envision the water, just cleansing you of the day or the week or the month or the year or your life. And you put the energy and the intention into that, you know, it goes. And so for me, I, yeah, I live in Los Angeles. So I, I have to take just moments sometimes mm-hmm. and that's all, that's all I get. And it's worth it every time. And it doesn't have to be a big ritual. It doesn't have to be like candles and incense and like singing bowls, you know, it can just be you and the earth. And, and some people really recommend like digging a hole and putting your feet all the way into the earth. And especially like if you're flying or if you go um, you know, to another country, another time zone, that's actually the best way to combat jet lag too, is to put your feet in the earth and allow the ions and the electromagnetic frequency of wherever that place is to inform your body. Like, okay, you're here. This is where you're pretty right good. Now. There's pretty good clinical research on the benefits of grounding and yeah. earthing. And it's one of those things that, you know, a lot of skeptical people have challenged, yeah. but it seems like the preponderance of evidence is leaning in favor of this being 
scientifically validated. Not only something you can feel, because for damn sure you can feel yeah. it when you're out there. I mean, why do you feel so fucking good when you're on the beach? Well, I don't know. You're barefoot in the sand and yeah. then these negative ions coming off the crashing waves and the sun is tickling your skin mm -hmm. and flooding your body with yep. vitamin D. So yeah, all right, the beach is fun and it might be a nice place to have a Corona, but it's also a whole host of other things that are happening. But that can happen in so many different environments yeah. as well. And also unplugging from the electronics for a minute, yeah. you know, like let turn those things off when you go have this little ritual and have it be, you know, some small ritual to kind of recenter yourself. Yeah. It's and even like, even the other day we went wake surfing yesterday, yeah. you know, and it that's, so fun. yeah, that's like <laughs> my huge medicine is yeah. it's not, you just go would drive 15 minutes to my brother's house and we go on the boat and it's, you were talking and you were saying, you know, even this is a bathing ritual. Yeah. You know, like getting into the lake and just floating there for a second is a bathing ritual. And I think it's just important to, like you said, reiterate that it, it doesn't have to be candles. It doesn't have to be all of this. It doesn't have to mm -hmm. be that. Like jump into the lake and just come out and be cleansed. Yeah. And, and you, yeah. And, and I'll, I'll let you finish in a second too. But, and also reminding you that it doesn't, you don't have to be a certain type of person to mm -mm. do it. Like, it's not like you have to create this identity that that identity is in alignment with bathing ritual. That identity <laughs> is in alignment with being in the night. Like you're a woman. Yeah. You're in alignment with all the things because yeah. everything is connected ultimately. So like, don't feel like you have to be a certain type of person or be a certain type of thing yeah. to enjoy and experience it. You're a human. You're yeah, all or that same you can't team. Yeah. because you work a nine to five job or right. because you live in this place or know these people or any of those labels, like everyone can. We all came from the same place. And the air, just the breathing, you always say like just six deep breaths changes so many different aspects of your neural biology instantly. And even just going out somewhere where you, where it's just quiet and just taking six deep breaths. That's all the time you have, like, do it. Yeah, totally. So there's, I think there's external pressure on yeah. women that I think needs to be recognized as well. So I think that's, that's actually like an internal choice. You know, I think we got to put this on everybody and this isn't just, this is men and women too. Yeah. Cause men need to connect with nature as well. Um, but I think this is pretty much like, this is on us. Yeah. You know, and there's other things that are still on us because we can still overcome them. But there is a lot of societal pressure that puts value on certain specific superficial elements of a female and underappreciates. <laughs> this freaking bug. <laughs> I'm telling. Oh, yeah. Here it is. It's a spider. Ah! Oh, it's okay. It's fine. Come on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now she on the floor. Okay, okay and yeah, underappreciates. So yeah, and I <laughs> <laughs> underappreciates certain elements, overappreciates yeah. other elements, and that's <laughs> that's in the superficial beauty category. Huh. And also puts cast shame on women who are looking to seek pleasure for the sake of pleasure. Oh yeah. So there's like, those are two elements that I really want you guys to kind of yeah. look into is like how you overcome this idea of like, oh yeah, being pretty is what matters. Cause that's what's rewarded on Instagram. That's what's rewarded in magazines, whatever. And then also this idea that, oh, if you are doing anything sexually for pleasure, you're a slut and you should be shamed and you shouldn't feel good about yourself. And you're, you know, devaluing the commodity that you have. I mean, I think that the pleasure thing is the same as the, uh, how we got disconnected from the earth. It used to be from my perspective and with what I've read about ancient times and you guys totally are into sex at dawn and how we used to live or how our, our traditions were in tribal times, like when we were connected to the earth and our bodies, like there was no shame around pleasure. It was because Orgasmic energy is the most powerful energy in the universe. It, a baby is exponentially more likely to be created when there's an orgasm, if that's what you're trying for, if a woman is ovulating. And so I think that pleasure, especially like when it's celebrated, is the most powerful thing ever. And, and from my perspective, what I've received about pleasure in my life or the programming around pleasure has been 
based on people's religious upbringings and yeah. And it not being something that's, that's seen for what it is like our, our greatest joy and, and people take ecstasy, right? You know, you take pills of ecstasy when we can generate ecstasy inside of our bodies by ourselves with breathing and with touching and with loving each other and just seeing each other deeply. And yeah, like you can do deeper things than just looking in each other's eyes, but man, that, that's something that I, I don't really understand, honestly, why we shame pleasure. I think that it makes, you know, women in their power feel small because you also get pleasure from feeling the magnitude of your magic or your body, Mm -hmm. or when your heart is pumping and racing and you love someone and they love you. So I think that it's, and it plays into, you know, we, we perceive the beautiful women as the ones who are receiving pleasure or creating pleasure or yeah. generating it with someone else. I, well, I mean, I think there's a, there, I think this is really, if we're talking purely about pleasure and, and I do want to get into the superficiality, yeah. but I think there's a lot of insecurity that has facilitated this and it's yeah. insecurity <clears throat> from men that the women that they're with might want pleasure from someone else. Mm. Insecurity from women that the other women that are around them might want pleasure from their man. Or be able to give it to him you know, better. Or Yeah, exactly. So there's this, it's based on, yes, religion has a, has a part in it, but there's also based on this possessive mm. idea of mm. relationship. Like, you're mine. Yeah. And, and anybody who's a threat to that is, let's diminish that, you know, and let's shame that so that it becomes less of a likely possibility. You know, because you want to... We're taught that we should be the sole pleasure providers yeah. of our mate, always, you know, and at, at all times. And that, I think, is a very dangerous place to be in. I think a lot of my insecurities were wrapped up in that specifically. Because for me, in all of my relationships previous to this one, I was very alpha. And I was alpha because... There's no other woman on the planet that's like me, period. And you don't look at anybody else. You don't talk to anybody else because why would you ever think about it? You know? And it's just like, oh, skirt. Because that always happens to where they want to talk to somebody else or they're flirting with somebody else or it's just this whole thing. Or I'm doing that and they think Mm. they should be, I shouldn't look at anybody else. And I would wake up. With in relationships and the and these men are great. They're they're beautiful beings, and there was nothing wrong with nothing wrong with them. But I would wake up thinking, hmm, I'm bored now, hmm. you know. And then I was like, something is wrong with me now. Mm. Like why I'm not supposed to feel this way. I'm supposed to look at you, and you're supposed to be the one, and that's that's it. And so I would go through all of this shit of like shaming myself for wanting to be with other people, and then I would make them feel guilty or play a game, some sort of game with them because they kind of wanted to be with somebody else. And I was extremely competitive with other girls my entire life. I never really had a whole lot of girlfriends. And I, mm. and I think that probably stems from my childhood, you know, my parents separating really early and my dad had multiple kind of women in and out of my life mm. and, and they were great, but it was just, I constantly felt like I had to stand and be like, this is my place. Like you're coming into my home. And I kind of took that into all of my relationships and then venturing into an open relationship, flipped all that on its head. And now I have extremely beautiful and deep relationships with friends of like girlfriends of mine, just, you know, best friends of mine that I don't think I would ever be able to reach if I didn't deal with that. Mm -hmm. And so people think like, oh, how could you ever let your man fuck somebody else? And I'm like, man, outside of that, like I have so many awesome girlfriends right now that have my back and everywhere we go, people are like, how do you guys love each other this much? And it's real. It's because we've dealt with all of our insecurities and we see each other and we want to be around each other. We want to support and we want like the best for them. And that's not something you find and a lot of friend groups. Yeah, the possessiveness surrounding the pleasure control actually creates some of that discrepancy and distance in the sisterhood. Because if you believe that, if somebody else is threatening your pleasure monopoly, then any pretty girl around you, you're going to be like, you're a frenemy. 
Yeah. You know, because at any point you might be threatening my possession and sole proprietorship of, of my man or any man's pleasure yeah. that I might get. So it creates this realm of competition when it's a realm of, yo, there's pleasure to spare. Totally. There's, there's pleasure all day. I can give it to myself. These people can give it guys, girls, whoever. Yeah. Like pleasure is in abundance. It is. And it's not like, like this is my pleasure cup, but I'm going to drink it all up and then it's gone. Like, no, Ooh. it just keeps, there's know? more and more forever. There's more. Yeah. It's, it's like infinite. You can in, enjoy and love and, f- and feel pleasure all of the time if you want. Yeah. Like, it's not going anywhere just because I give pleasure to you and maybe I give pleasure to somebody else. Like my cup doesn't drain. And your pleasure value, the value <laughs> of your ability to give pleasure. Like there's this idea and I think this has been propagated and we've even seen this in our friend group, you know, people who've had this bias. Oh, if you give it away too often, it'll become devalued, right? Well, all right, that might work with like, you know, a jewelry, but it's not, doesn't work with vaginas. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like it's not, <laughs> it's not the same thing. Yeah. Like it doesn't work with, a, like it doesn't actually create something. Maybe for some really insecure people, you know, who need validation. I think you got to talk about the importance of validation. Like you get an extra validation bump if you are with a virgin and they've only liked you and Mm. you're the only one. All right. So if you're in this for validation, which shit, you know, I had my own struggles and still have my own struggles with validation, validating myself through the partners I've had. And I'm sure that's something that all of us have dealt with. Like, Oh, that's my partner. That's my man. That's the person I'm sleeping. Look how cool I am because they're having sex with me. Right. So, but if you get past that, there is actually no devaluation of anything based upon your access to pleasure. There's might be a devaluation of your own external validation, but guess what? That external validation game is fucking hell. Oh yeah. I mean, that's, it's interesting because my experience was the opposite. I used to want to be like the cool girl. So I would let my partners, I'd be like, oh, I don't care. Like, go sleep with whoever you want. Like, I'm gonna be, you know, I love you. Like, I'm here, I got you, whatever. And really, it just made me like hate every time he actually would do it. And I would feel so insecure. And it was exactly the frenemy thing. And I was just so terrified that he would leave me if I didn't let him go and cheat or like, because I grew up and, you know, you talk about your dad and having like lots of women. My parents broke up because of infidelity because my dad couldn't be monogamous. And so I had all these, this program in my head that like men are going to do it anyway. They're going to, they're going to go and fuck whoever they want and there's nothing you can do about it. And so you might as well just deal with it. And you're going to be cooler and more desirable if you just accept it and let it happen. And I was always like dating models because I had deep, deep wounding about my own external beauty. And I felt I had this scar, I had this accident. And and so to me, this made me ugly and deformed and no one would ever listen to me or care about me. And this was all, it didn't matter that I was smart or that I was funny or that I was well-educated. None of that mattered. It was like, this is it. And so I used like male models to do exactly that. Look what I can get, but they can sleep with whoever they want because like, I'm really cool. And I was just broken inside Mm. when that was happening to me and I let it happen. And it wasn't a monopoly. It was just like a complete lack of confidence and a complete lack of safety Mm. in the relationship you know, not trusting the love that that person had for me. And it was bad. (laughs) It was bad news back then. And, and it caused like so much heartache because I wasn't able to like have the types of conversations that you guys have about like what this is bringing up for me, where this wounding comes from, like, how can I heal this? And yeah, I mean, we talked about it yesterday. Like it's, there's still sometimes like I get lost in like needing validation from people and especially like friends or, or, you know, people in the industries that I'm in or want to be in. And I think that so much of it comes from like just devaluing myself so much that I then felt like I had no access to any type of power in my relationship. Yeah. And and being, avoiding the truth, the truth about who you are, the truth about what is really 
really there, what you're really feeling, like what you really, what's really going on and the real work that's under the surface. I think it's interesting because we had, we came from basically opposite, like polar sides of that, but we had the same pain, Mm -hmm. you know, like we both weren't happy doing that and we didn't feel like we had control and felt like it, it was just fucked. Yeah. You know, but it's still being on polar opposite. So that's why I feel like relationships today, like there has to be fine, be monogamous, be monogamous, don't be monogamous, be whatever you want to be, but realize that it's not binary. There's so many other options Mm -hmm. and be able to consciously choose that for you because it feels best. Not because you think your partner wants it or you think your parents would prefer this or society says it's better. Yeah. Yeah. And I got a lot of shame even from the partners that I was open with about the things that I wanted to do about, because like, you know, you have your kind of like sub thing and I have a dom thing and I, I like masculine men. And so I like want my partner to be super masculine, but then sexually, like I love to dominate (laughs) and I, and I have this, you know, it used to be when I would drink, I would have this like crazy blood (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> ripping fucking dominatrix come out and I got shamed for that because I was supposed to be the one that he would come home to and like right. that he that wasn't like that oh she would never do that she's my you know sweet little but then he would go out and fucking do crazy shit with all these other girls and I had to just like be sweet and have dinner on the table and it was like nope yeah. Yeah. All of those false prescriptions for yeah. what should be. And yeah. as soon as there's are they're all just prisons that we put ourselves in totally. locking cage after cage, after cage, realizing that we had the key all the, the whole time. And that's true. Yeah. And I think society and, and the world at large will try to put those prisons and those delusions on you. And it happens with every, now it happens with every single person actually tangibly with Instagram, because Oof. what happens with Instagram is you, especially at the start, until you establish something and establish your actual tribe on there, you will get rewarded for the more superficial thing that you do if you're you're a female, typically, (laughs) right? Like what's the, you know, there would be times through the years where you're like, everybody just wants me to post my butt. (laughs) You know, it would be what you'd say. And you'd get discouraged when you'd post something heartfelt and meaningful. It still happens. It still happens. (laughs) I but post the, my ass and it's like, mm, crushing it today on Instagram. <laughs> I post like an inspirational quote and everyone's like, Pfft. yeah. No, I'm just kidding. I actually get like a lot of love. I, that's what I actually really, I was talking to my brother about this and Chrissy recently and they were complimenting me on the fact that I can still hold down like the very sexy side because I fuck, I like my body. I think I'm yeah. happy about it, you know, and I enjoy it. And I'm like, I'm showing it because I like it, not because I'm worried about what Joe at AOL.com says or whatever, <laughs> but it's like, I really enjoy it. But then I also... Joe at AOL.com is crushing it, by the yeah. way. That's <laughs> he great, loves that, that booty. Is, that is a great He's email. like, double like. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's just like, like you're saying, being in truth with it. Like post sexy, if you, if you want to do it for yourself and you love it and you're not really looking for validation, and then on the other side, like if you want to change the world, be able to post that yeah. too and be okay when people, you get 50 likes as opposed to 2,000 likes And recognize likes or that your audience, your audience will take time to shift, right? Like you won't, if you've built an audience pandering to their voyeurism, yeah. like they're going to continue reinforcing the, your, the voyeurism until you build that other audience that is seeking something different and that audience will eventually become more meaningful. But the quick low hanging fruit to get those likes up is the most superficial thing that you can do. It's the same thing when you're getting dressed up to go to a bar, the same thing when you're getting dressed up. Like if you want that quick fishing lure to capture as much attention as possible. Okay. Like you can understand what that is, but if you want like those deeper, those deeper lures for the deeper waters, will then be able to express both sides. Yeah, what feels best to you. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, that's the, that's the, exactly what you just said, which I know you, why you fun of? You know, <laughs> that is exactly my story with Instagram. I don't have a big audience because I have only, I've been like crushed when I post something and I like work so, I think so hard about what I'm going to write and I put this beautiful quote up and it's a nature photo or like something that I'm not in and nobody gives a fuck. And it's like, 
it's so because we have and I just watched last night on PBS um, this show about what they do or what happens in teenagers brains when they are on Instagram. And it's crazy. they were 86 percent more likely to like a photo that had more likes than not. And, oh, hi, hi, baby. Baby. Hi, baby. and so if the if the photo, the exact same photo would be like a photo of a cat and a photo of kids at a lake. If it had three likes versus 50 likes, they were 86% more likely to like the one with more likes and just mm-hmm. skip through the other one. And so we, myself totally included, have gotten so completely attached to the external validation of Instagram and what it means for people to like you because of your social media and, and to compare your friends who have, oh, well, she's putting her sexy booty up and she's all empowered in the way that she's doing it. And she's got 100,000 followers and I don't. So I guess I should just post more of my booty. But it's like, no, if that's not what people are following me for, which like, you know, you, you and I have been talking about this so much that you're intent upon sharing more of your message as mm-hmm. opposed to any other or anyone else's. I haven't been aligned with that. I have been doing exactly that, showing people what I think they want to see and then feeling sad or bad or not enough and totally unworthy when people don't respond to the things that I care about, that Mm -hmm. I put out. And sometimes I'll even delete it. I'm like, oh, I'm embarrassed, (laughs) you know? And that is like, I even, I mean, I look, I I catch myself and I'm like, whoa, whoa." I get it. I mean, I almost, (laughs) I almost quit doing my podcast because Mm -hmm. for about a year and a half, my viewership was not growing at all. Mm. And in some cases was even shrinking. And I was like, what the fuck am I doing this mm. anyways? You know? And then eventually I was like, you know what? I'm just going to double down. I'm going to commit to doing it every week. And because I like doing this, I like these conversations. I think they are important conversations. And then it's since then it's six, eight times, 12 yeah. times what it was at that point. And that was only a few years ago. And I think it's, it's the consistency of it. Cause a lot of people will, cause I could have made that, that, you know, that choice to just not ah, fuck it. You know, it's not growing. People don't care enough. People don't care. And I think a lot of people do that with Instagram. They're like, well, I'm not going to post my booty and nobody else wants to see anything else. So, well, you know, fuck social media. I don't need to put out anything, but then they're, instead of, they're just disengaging from an opportunity to create community, to share content, to share ideas that could be impactful even to their small group because they're using these other external criteria to judge. Totally. I think the overarching thing of like this entire thing is truth. Like post what is truthful to you. Like don't post what you think Aubrey's going to like, what I'm going to like, or Mia's going to like, or your neighbor's going to like. Like if, if you want to post your ass because you think your ass is crushing it today, then you post your ass. Yeah. And who cares if you get two likes or you get 50,000 likes? Go for it. Word. Yeah. Same with just word like- Word I am word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that's absolutely it. And I think trusting the truth of, of your womanhood and not, you know, in all the ways yeah. and exploring and experimenting and tr- remembering and figuring and sorting you know, like that's the, I think that's the new woman. That's totally. the, that's the Quetzalcoatl, right? That's like the, the combination of all of these things that we've tried to put in little boxes. Oh, this one's a slut. This one's a hippie. This one's a Instagram hoe. This one's a this, this <laughs> Stripper, one's a this, this one's a, exactly, boss, whatever, okay. you know, bottle service girl, whatever, <laughs> like model, you know, yeah. like whatever, whatever, all of this criteria and all these labels that we have, these emblemizations that we put someone in so that we can discard them and not see them as God, not see them as goddess. Like maybe let's discard that shit. Yeah. And maybe let's sure. try to see through ourselves who we are, no matter what our body looks like, no matter what our shape looks like and have honest conversations be like, all right, well, my body's like this. That's cool. I could improve it if yeah. I wanted to, but first I have to acknowledge what I would need to do and why I have these compulsions and like get, start getting to the fucking root, you yeah. know, like get to the root, be truthful and then watch the woman or the man that is you. It's like, start to fucking flower yeah. and see what those flowers look like. Cause they're going to look like flowers that are different than any flowers that exist on the whole and fucking it's magnetic. Planet. Like for yeah, me, and I was having word. a conversation with somebody recently. And for me, the 
people, do I have more spiders on me? Mm -hmm. They're the sign of creation, girl. You got a whole new thing happening right now. <laughs> we having the conversation about creation. It's true. They're like just inviting you to weave your own web. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> <laughs> just got the message. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Um, yes. So the people who I'm like most attracted to is pe are people that are just fully themselves. Yeah. Like it, it doesn't matter what they look like. It doesn't matter what they wear. It doesn't matter if they have makeup on, what shoes, bag, whatever it is. It's just like if you are fully yourself. I fucking love you. You're a bad like, bitch. You're yeah. a bad bitch. Maybe you're just at a party and you're just dancing like a crazy person. I'm like, God, I love you. Like yeah. just people that is so inspiring and something that I find so attractive and like magnetic. Yeah. And I feel like that's what we need to be teaching. Like go, I'm all about go get your Botox, go get your makeup done. If you want to have, you know, I dye my hair, I've had my boobs done, whatever. But that doesn't mean shit at the end of the day. At the end of the day, if you're 100% yourself, you're the most attractive and beautiful version of yourself than yeah. ever. And that, that to me is just more, more beautiful than any sort of, any external shit that you could put on. That's what made me fall in love with you guys was how you made me feel when I was being myself. We're like at Burning Man, just like, I'm fucking bleeding. I'm in crazy outfits. I'm just gonna go nuts and I'm gonna be loud and I'm gonna say whatever I want. And you guys just made me feel alive. I'm like, yes! I know, yeah. I know. Do it more! Every time I walked into Wendy's, like, yay! <laughs> <laughs> He's screaming <laughs> I was like, oh my God, this is fucking amazing. This yeah. is the first time I ever get to be fully myself. And like, people are warm and inviting and it just made me wanna be more of it. And it did lead to me, you know, like, getting a little nervous and like wanting external validation and coming here and being like, okay, I need to be the same level of power and magic that I was at Burning Man. And that's what it does. And yet like, if we're talking about being a real woman, the word woman, I like love etymology, obviously, um, the, means womb man. And man comes from manas, which means mind. So a woman is someone who's using her womb as her mind, her creation that portal, that access point to the divine. And man, if you're doing that, and especially like I'm so inspired about the, the Instagram thing and the truth, if everything is coming from truth, it's not just about Instagram. It's about like, oh, mm. it's one womb. It's one heart. It's one mind. It's one being. It's one source. And it's looking at me through your eyes and through your eyes and through the earth and Man, that's a whole different way of being. And it's so interesting because that's exactly what the advertising and the superficial, like, capitalist world that we live in has been built on is the opposite of truth. They're trying to, not they, whatever. There's no such thing as they. It's my consciousness. I totally recognize that. <laughs> it's all part of me. I'm putting labels and form onto it. Um, and so in my consciousness, the society that I've created looks back at me or like tries to sell me. I'm trying to sell myself on the illusion that the external is what matters. Buy this makeup, drive this car, have this status, get this purse, like this outfit, and then you'll be cool. And then you'll be loved. Post this on Instagram, put only your butt. And then people are going to like you. You know, it's not, it has not been my experience. I posted a lot of pictures of my butt. It ain't working. <laughs> no. And it's, you know, it, it's, it's never really about the thing. It's not yeah. about the car. It's not about mm -hmm. the makeup. It's not about the thing. Play with all that if you want, yeah. you know, go for it. Enjoy it. It's not what you do. It's not what the thing is. It's how you engage with it. That's, I think, the key. And I think to, to really know that if you're engaging authentically with anything, like you are going to be magnetic and you are going to be you and you are going to be the best version of yourself. And if you're interested in helping the world and making a huge impact, well, one of the biggest things you can do is to truly be yourself because that gives permission to everybody else to truly be themselves. And that's fucking huge because if we can really be ourselves and love ourselves and open the truth of ourselves, yeah. the, that real version of ourselves to receive love from our friends, our brothers, our sisters, our lovers, our family, then we can really, really enjoy this fucking experience called life. Well, it becomes, free. yeah. 
we're free and it becomes celebrated, right? Yeah. That becomes celebrated as opposed to the masks that we put on. It's you being yourself. Fuck yes. I love you. Yeah. I'm being myself. Yes. Let's celebrate that. You're being yourself. Yes. Yes. And we're like, all be ourselves. <laughs> yeah. and it's just, it, that's just a beautiful reality that can happen. And I feel like is, is in the process of happening. Yeah. That's what we're here doing, right? Boom. Yeah. At me and magic. At Miss Two With Jits. a K, not a C. <laughs> With a K. <laughs> and thank you, everybody. I'm Aubrey Marcus. I love you guys so much. We'll have, let's have some more chats. Yeah, let's, let's have, have chats. some more chats. Let's do some more things. Yeah. Let's fill my pleasure cup. <laughs> <Let's>, <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Camera's off yeah. immediately. Hi. Much love, everybody. Peace.